Hello and welcome to this week's preview show. BBC Radio Solent's Chris Temple is back alongside me as we look ahead to some midweek football at Molyneux. Here's what's coming up. We'll look back at Saturday's 2-0 defeat to Crystal Palace before moving on to tomorrow's game at Wolves. Well, we are going to go straight into that game against Crystal Palace. Chris, it was a, a very tough evening, wasn't it? surprisingly tough um I think we thought that you know everybody you know the way that Eddie has the players prepared and, and fit and and sharp and ready to go and it, it fell a bit flat really didn't it I mean yes Palace um are very very difficult to break down and they're so well organized under Roy Hodgson that um if you do concede the first goal then you, you've got a mountain to climb really um and then to concede a second one so quickly it was it wasn't all over, but certainly Bournemouth had to improve dramatically in the second half. And while they were, you know, it was better in the second half than the first, it still wasn't hitting the levels that, that Eddie would demand. I just thought the players looked, you know, they just didn't look sharp, really. Um, you know, a couple of them can be excused because David Brook hasn't played in a long time and a couple of the other ones have had injuries coming back. Uh, Steve Cook, for example. So you'd expect those guys to maybe not quite be at full speed just yet. Um, but I think, I thought they looked absolutely gassed at the end of the game as well, which is very unlike... Um, a Bournemouth team they're normally you know the fittest of, of the lot um, there was a lot of running to be done obviously because they had a lot of the ball and they were having to keep it moving and trying to uh, swing from side to side to try and unlock Palace but I just thought it was you know the likes of Nathan Ake and Jefferson Lerma and a couple of others you don't usually see them sort of physically um, blowing if you like by the end of the game so all in all yeah I mean they didn't have any answers to Palace's uh, defensive structure um, and they're going to face a similar challenge at Wolves with that. So that's something they need to rectify pretty quickly. And those two early goals, they really did make it very difficult. As you say, you know, Palace defended very, very well. Their structure was in place. Their formation was in place. And in the end, in the end there was just no way through. Yeah, it was too easy. I didn't see a conclusive angle of the first free kick. I thought Zaha went down probably a little bit easy, but, you know, he's clever. If he gets within 25 yards of goal, he knows they've got Milivojevic and others who can deliver a set piece. So he, he is going to try and go down. I thought he went down a bit flimsily there as he's been accused of doing so many times in the past. And he then had the temerity later in the game to accuse, um, I can't remember who it was, Adam Smith maybe or someone, Harry Wilson, of going down too easily, which I thought was a bit, a bit, uh, a bit brassy of him, let's put it that way. But yeah, it was, uh, I guess, uh, annoying to give away a cheap free kick and nothing Aaron Ramsdale could do about it. I saw someone on the TV saying that if he gets a hand to it, he should save it. But I mean, he didn't have a chance with that really. The second one was poor defensively, wasn't it? I mean, it was way too easy. It was a simple little triangle. Um, someone lost their runner. Um, and that's so frustrating. There were enough red and black shirts back there to, to be able to deal with it. The one thing I will say, you know, is as much as we're talking about Bournemouth not being at it, got to say I thought Palace were, you know, bang on it. They were sharp. They were very good. Um, and, they're, you know, you look back at some of their games earlier in the season, some of the points they've let slip away, you know, they could quite conceivably have been chasing the Champions League spot and could even be now if they can manage to continue this. And the one thing this little spell will give you is a bit of positive momentum will send you sailing through these next few games on a high. So, um, yeah, I would say the teams in the top six should, should watch out from what we saw against Palace. And I saw Jurgen Klopp's comments earlier in the week about he saw the Palace game and he'd noted how sharp Palace looked as well because, of course, Liverpool played Palace shortly after Bournemouth played Wolves. And one of the big talking points of the game, of course, was that Gary Cahill challenge on Joshua King. Now, Eddie Howe said in his press conference this morning that he did actually think that Gary Cahill got to the ball first. What was your view on that? I watched it back a number of times. Um, Willow and I were in different camps on this one because Willow thought it was a definite red card. Now, he normally errs on the side of, of players. So uh, I was sort of surprised he would have put a few tackles like that in himself, I'm sure, where you get the ball and then you leave one on someone as well. I, I've watched it numerous times. I still can't quite decide, to be honest, which if I was the VAR, I'd be no good. Um, you know, the VAR who looked at it, Simon Hooper, decided that probably it was borderline enough to stay on the field with what was decided. And of course, it wasn't even a free kick. Let's let's not forget that because Gary Cahill did get a big chunk of the ball, which is what the referee on the night decided, um, you know, he saw and decided. It left Joshua King with a painful blow. The good news is that that's not serious and that he could be available, probably not for Wolves, but uh, maybe for the Newcastle game. But yeah, I've seen a lot of people saying it was, you know, a red card because of the follow through and it was high and it endangered the safety of Joshua King. I take all of that on board. Um, I think it was a robust challenge where he knew he, he was going to get the ball, um, but I don't think he could do much else. His natural follow through, he wasn't off the ground. His foot, of course, was raised when he actually made contact with Joshua King because he just played the ball and the momentum of the challenge is going to lift your foot slightly off the ground. It wasn't like he was coming in from a, a high angle challenging down on Joshua King's ankle. So, 
I think it probably was the right decision. That might not be popular. There were people watching this now going, what are you talking about? Um, but you could have seen also, if it had been given as a red, you could have seen white. And in terms of the other Bournemouth players on the pitch, David Brooks, great to see him back. And Arnaut Damjima coming on in the second half as well. And, and there were bright, bright sparks from him. I thought they were probably the two bright sparks out of everybody, to be honest with you, and two that, you know, the team have been shorn off for so long. No surprise to see that David Brooks, you know, started to feel it after an hour because, as the gaffer mentioned in his presser as well, that that hand injury that he was playing with a cast to protect had obviously robbed him of a little bit of training time as well. So he will improve with every game, but we saw some great little moments, a couple of little skillful touches. And again, you just see his vision where he's looking, you know, his, his, um, his angles and where he sees teammates and, uh, you, and also, the, he's so snappy with his little passes as well, which can often catch defences on the hop. I thought Dan Juma came on and, you know, he had a bright first 10 or 15 minutes. He faded out of it a little bit after that. But he definitely showed with a couple of little runs and the ability to get at defenders as well. But it's one thing Bournemouth can sometimes lack um, with the fact that they play the inverted wingers. And you often, you know, in the former days of Ryan Fraser, um, you know, a left, a left footer on the right and a right footer on the left. What that doesn't do is sometimes it allows the wingers to get at the fullbacks on the outside, which costs Bournemouth a, a little bit of width sometime. I think we saw Dan Juma was happy to use either foot. You know, he's naturally stronger on his right, but he's happy to go around the outside as well. Um, so that's where the, the question marks about team selection in terms of whether you you're better playing Rico because he gives you a, a natural left side and he'll go outside as on the overlap. Um, like we see Jack Stacey do. And I thought Jack Stacey, again, got up and down brilliantly, um, ran himself into the ground without really having too much room to work in. So, yeah, Brooks and Dan Juma, two guys who great to have back and will only get better with every game they play, hopefully. And one question I'm sure that everyone is dying to know. What was it like being behind closed doors? Do you know what? Um... It was strange, of course. Absolutely, it was strange. At Bournemouth, we're lucky in, in the sense that because it's a small stadium, um, everybody's pretty close. So actually, in terms of the, what we're picking up on our microphones in our ears, we have a little microphone that points towards the pitch uh, to bring us the sort of sound effects, if you like. And actually, because we were, close, we're pretty close to the benches as well, we actually did have a little bit of a soundtrack. So we had the benches shouting, we had the players shouting, we get the referees whistle. So actually, for us, it wasn't quite as echoey and cavernous as... I thought it would be. Of course, we also had the commentators in front of us and behind us who were quite loud as well, who were probably bleeding through because there was no other noise. Um, in terms of the overall experience, I'm, gonna, I'm not just going to say this because I'm on the club website, but I thought the club were superb in terms of the media setup. Everything ran smoothly. Um, you know, even Willow was allowed in, which is incredible. Um, but, you know, it was brilliantly executed from that point of view. I, I have to say I left feeling a little bit hollow in terms of because of the experience I'm used to in turn, turning up to a game, chatting to my press colleagues in the press room, um, chatting to Eddie and the players after the game face-to-face, -face, all of those things, I probably set my expectations a little bit high in terms of what I thought it was going to be like. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like that. I spoke to probably eight people, um, you know, a couple of guys from your media team, three or four other radio broadcasters, and that was pretty much it. A couple of people on the gate um, because half of the press were on the other side of the ground. So, yeah, yeah. Um, it was great to be back, brilliant to be back in the stadium, great to be seeing football. I think probably the result and the performance contributed to me feeling a bit, a bit deflated after the game as well. Certainly a, a very strange experience indeed. Now then, next up for the Cherries is tomorrow's trip to Molyneux and Eddie Howe has faced the press in this morning's virtual press conference. Echo Ben's and me's comments, who I thought spoke really, really well after the game. The majority of Burnley supporters that I met in my time there were absolutely fantastic people and on behalf of this club, anti-all racism and, and discrimination. We feared at the start when we went down with the ankle, I'll be honest, that potentially a season could be over, but the scan showed it was a very minor brain to one of his ligaments. So we'll, we'll make a late call on Josh to see whether he's available for this match. My players knew the importance of the game. They were very good professionals. They wanted to win. It just didn't quite show in the way that it needed to. Well, certainly we felt that the negative effect of not having a crowd in our home game, I, I, that was absolutely clear. When we're 1-0 down and usually you'd get a response and a feeling from the crowd, we just didn't have that, that support to um, carry us onto new heights. So we're in a very difficult position. We're fighting to try and stay in the league, but one win, one result changes everything. It changes perceptions, it changes our position, it changes the whole outlook from everybody connected with this football club. Well, that was Eddie Howe speaking in this morning's press conference. Chris, uh, it's a trip to Wolves tomorrow for the Cherries and it's a, a good opportunity to forget Saturday and hopefully turn things around. 
Yeah, and with a week afterwards until the Newcastle game, it, it's going to be you know important that they turn in a much better performance. I mean, it's, it's going to be a tougher task. I think that's for sure. Palace, you know, no one quite knew how they were going to approach it. We've seen Wolves. Um, you know, they played well at West Ham. Uh, they're a very, very good side. Um, they've been difficult for Bournemouth to, to break down. Obviously, earlier in the season, the game at the Vitality Stadium, Simon Francis was sent off in the first half, of course, for two yellow cards. So Bournemouth played most of the game with 10 men, but, or half the game with 10 men. But obviously came back with a Steve Cook goal and, and you know, possibly could have nicked something at the end. So uh, last year it was hammering down the rain at Wolves, um, lost 2-0. Um, obviously there's a, there was a great day there in the championship when Matt Ritchie scored that goal that was pinging around everywhere. And the, I remember the crowd all the way along the lower tier on the far side at Molyneux from where we sit, um, which was a very, very enjoyable day. But yeah, this time round, Wolves chasing the Champions League, of course. Um, superbly organised, um, obviously got to the FA Cup semi-finals last year as well as having a great season, still in the Europa League. Uh, and that performance the other day against West Ham was a great little sort of sharpener for them as well. Hardly concede any goals. I think it's five clean sheets in their last six games. I think only um, Liverpool have lost more games than Wolves this season as well. They do draw quite a few, which is, um, I think they've drawn 13, which nobody else has drawn more than them. So, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be tough. That's for sure. The only thing I will say is that going to Molyneux is normally a very hostile atmosphere. So a bit like the, the the reverse of what we saw at the Vitality when Bournemouth really did need would have needed a crowd in the second half to lift the performance. Um, this time round, hopefully going to Wolves without a crowd um, will it isn't count in Bournemouth's favour necessarily, but hopefully it makes the task you know not quite as uh, as onerous as if that was a, a passionate um, Wolves crowd behind them. Well, that's actually something Eddie Howe said this morning in his pre-match press conference. You know, he said the lack of a crowd last week didn't do Bournemouth any favours. So hopefully going away to Wolves, it'll be interesting to see what it's like in an away environment. And it can actually help his side. Yeah, I saw some people after the game were sort of tweeting me and reacting to the game saying that that was an excuse from Bournemouth that they, that they didn't have the crowd or whatever. And I know what they're saying. Of course, every time you, you don't play well, you and you talk about anything else apart from the uh, the direct performance of the players, then it's going to look like an excuse. But I do think that I do think the lack of a crowd is something that players are going to have to get used to for sure and quickly, obviously, because there are only eight more games to go. But there, lots of talk in advance about what it would be like, and you know, we had a, a psychologist on uh, BBC Radio Solent talking about the fact that you know players arousal levels, you know, they they're used to feeding off the crowd, they thrive in a, a performance environment where they're under the spotlight, and yes, they're still under the spotlight in terms of the games being watched by millions around the world, but you can't see them, and they're not playing a part in your in your atmosphere and the the sort of the stage on which you're performing. So there's no doubt, I think, that some players will have found it hard to raise themselves to the fact that was a very important Premier League game rather than just a, a knockabout pre-season friendly. So I think hopefully this time, going to an away game, the fact you've got the travel, you know, travelling to the game and everything that goes with the, the whole away game experience will just wake everybody up a little bit and sharpen people up. Because, of course, don't forget Bournemouth train in their own stadium as well a lot of the time because the training ground is at the ground. So while familiarity can do one thing for you and be, be, be good for um, a performance, also sometimes it maybe doesn't quite switch you on. Um, maybe that's an unfair accusation, I'm not sure. But we'll certainly see at Wolves whether Bournemouth are able to, to I guess, switch themselves on emotionally. In terms of the Wolves squad, you know, there's players, there's Jimenez, Yotta. Neves, Traore was brilliant against West Ham. Mm. You know, the list goes on. There's a lot of players there that are, are very, very dangerous and it's going to be tough to stop. And a very settled side as well. They don't make it too many changes. Um, you know, the back corner, Cody, I see lots of people saying they can't believe he hasn't played for England yet, the way he marshals that team. Willie Bolly has come back into the team after injury and, and basically they've, they've solidified and kept a raft of clean sheets since he's come back into the team. Ruben Neves, obviously, in the centre of midfield is, a, you know, a, an absolute baller, to be fair. You know, just does that sort of central central midfield uh, role, if you like. And up top, as you mentioned, Raul Jimenez, who's already set a new record for number of goals by a Wolves player in a Premier League season with his goal the other day at, at West Ham. Um, you know, I, I like him a lot. I, I think he's a great player, big physical specimen, but plays with a smile on his face as well and can really bring other players into the game. Very popular amongst the Wolves fans as well. Um, and he, you know, he started the season in, in great form too. So, they obviously play, usually play a 3-5-2 formation Wolves as well. They switched in the second half the other day when uh, Adama Traore came on. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him be unleashed from the start with the impact that he had uh, coming off the bench. And obviously the fact that it's a quick turnaround between matches as well. You wouldn't be wholly surprised if they, they tweak things and throw him in from the start. Because 
he's certainly a handful. And uh, yeah, whoever plays at left back, whether it's Adam Smith or Diego Rico or anybody else, um, would certainly have their hands full if he does play a big part. Well, let's talk about our team news because obviously we saw Joshua King. He, he had to be substituted the other day. It's not as bad as, as what was first feared, but the likes of Philip Billing, he just missed out the other day. And Eddie actually said this morning again, you know, he's, he's doing really, really well and he could well be fit for, for tomorrow night. Yeah, and again, often you don't realise the value of players until they're not there. And Phil Billing actually is, you know, he had an up and down season. He started strongly, dipped away a bit. But actually in the last few weeks before lockdown, I thought he was one of the one of the better players in the squad. So again, that, that shouldn't be underestimated how much possibly he was a, a bit of a miss in, in midfield as well. Um, you know, a big, obviously big physical specimen in terms of the, the power side of the game, but also, you know, a good footballer as well. So hopefully he's fit. That will add a, an extra dimension to, to midfield. I just wonder whether... In the home game, Eddie Howe went three at the back as well and, and matched up with um, with Wolves, I think I'm right in saying, and has done in the past as well. So it's a case of, does he do that again? Which obviously will be a formation change and, and getting wing-backs involved. They've got the personnel to do that. Um, Joshua King, hopefully only one game out, as we say. Um, and the other, I guess the other question marks is Harry Wilson was dragged the other day at half-time. Um, where does he fit in if they play, play wing-backs? Um, I thought I didn't think Joshua King was was on it before he got substituted. To be honest, anyway, I thought he I didn't think he did anything in the first half really, and he looked like one who was struggling to get going really. I thought Jefferson Lerma was surprisingly sluggish as well, actually. And again, someone you you can barely criticise all season in terms of effort and execution. I thought he was off it. Um, so yeah, there, there are choices to say the least, and obviously. It depends how much, with a clear week after the game, whether Eddie can afford to play basically the, the same 11 or 12 again um, with that big rest to come, or whether he chooses to, to rotate it around a little bit more um, with the depth of the squad they've now got available and the fact they, they weren't great the other night as well. So that's the, the big questions, is rotation how much or how little? Absolutely. Well, it's going to be a very interesting game tomorrow night at Molyneux. You can listen to Chris and Willow on BBC Radio Solon and on AFCB TV throughout the evening. Bye for now.